the Aguit, everyone. Kojima Toshiv, and welcome back to episode number 60 of the Inline G Flute Podcast with me, your host, motherfucking Inline G. Lads, we've got the second episode from my NFA convention series, and it was a guest I have been waiting for. I've been waiting until we're on the same continent, and when I spied that they were going to be at the NFA convention, I slid right into those DMs. Today's guest is University of Iowa professor, soloist, orchestral musician, chamber musician, recording artist, and all-round flute superstar, Nicole Esposito. Notice the pronunciation there, by the way. It's Esposito, not Esposito. It's Italian, not Spanish. I mess up a lot of pronunciations on this podcast, but that is not one of them. So, a lot of you guys may also know Nicole from being, in my opinion, the original flute superstar on social media. I actually realized prior to recording this interview, I've been following Nicole for 12 years on Facebook, which I had to go pour myself a whiskey after that. Facebook's only been about for five years. How is that possible? But anyway, lads and ladies and all in between, it's an amazing episode. I'm thrilled to have Nicole on. Quick note as well, this interview was recorded outside in sunny San Antonio, so audio listeners especially, you'll notice a gentle waterfall in the background. I hope it's to your liking aesthetically and it doesn't put you off too much. It was an artistic choice, which I'm not sure on yet. So, regular listeners, skip ahead a minute or two. You'll go find that interview straight away. Everybody else, hang about a second, because <clears throat> the NLG podcast is free, and it'll always be free. However, if you want to donate to the podcast, you can now do so through the Patreon. On the screen now is the address, and for the audio listeners, it is patreon.com forward slash the NLG flute podcast. It costs five euros a month. I think that's like six, seven dollars a month. And with that, you're genuinely keeping this podcast alive. You get four episodes a month of this podcast. No, come rain nor shine, I will get an episode out. If you listen to all four and you think, oh, if I saw a guy in the pub at the end of the month, I'd buy him a pint, you can do that digitally. Now, I do everything around here on my own. This is the definition of an independent podcast. Everything is done by myself. So becoming a patron helps generate a regular income for this podcast. And it also means I can keep sponsors away. Because sponsors want me to change the script. They don't want me to talk about this. They don't want me to swear. They don't want me to mention that. I can't slag off all those shitty things that are in the flute world. With you guys sponsoring the podcast, I can do whatever I want. So you guys being my sponsor makes everything so much better. And it keeps the theme and the spirit of this podcast alive. So thank you for that. Um, If you can afford to sign up over there. It is hugely appreciated. And to the people who are already there, thank you so much. It means the world. If you can't afford it, okay, there's a cost of living crisis right now. It's hard to make money as an artist. Don't worry about it. You will get the same episodes as everybody else for free. If you can't afford it, you're paying for someone who can't to go and listen. There's no extra content for people who pay. It's just a a model based on soundness and kindness. And also quickly... If you go to Flute Center to buy anything, use the code InlineG, check the description for what goodies you get with that. So, here is this week's InlineG Flute Podcast with the enigmatic Nicole Esposito. Yeah, you've done a lot of judging before, haven't you? A lot of competition stuff? Yeah, I think, especially with the NFA, I have either judged one or have had a student won every single NFA competition. No (laughs) way, seriously. Oh, that's a great stat. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Yeah. And so tomorrow's high school soloist. Yep. So what age does that go up to? 16 is that? That goes up to about 18, yeah. Okay. So pre, pre-bachelor, pre so okay. yeah. And how many judges are on the panel? I think there's usually five. Okay. Yeah, usually five. Okay, I'm always really curious about like competition judges. What are you looking for personally? What do you sort of value more than other other things? You know... Especially at high school there level. There are many different types of competition judges. We have what I call like the scorekeepers who are literally like... Didn't tongue the third note of bar yeah. 72. Yeah. That's not me. I got that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, obviously, I'm looking for someone who is honest with the score. Yeah. You know, who I really think is trying as best as possible to follow the composer's intentions as yeah. well as we can interpret them, of course. Um, and they have to have a certain performance charisma. Obviously, there has to be a certain aspect of not only understanding that, but being able to sell that to the yeah. audience. Um, obviously, as you know, players, we naturally gravitate towards certain maybe types of sounds or things like that. But I really try to set that aside and not okay. just go for my own like Bias. personal taste. Yeah. We all are going to be biased to some degree. It's impossible to not be you know, subjective. However, what I'm really looking for is someone who also plays consistent inside their own level. Okay. If you can understand what I mean. So there might be varying levels in a competition where someone might 
actually demonstrate that they have the ability to play at an yeah. extremely high level but not give a consistent performance okay. inside their level. But there might be someone who overall maybe is not quite as equipped but really gives a perf fantastic performance yeah. inside their own level of playing. I might actually gravitate towards that second okay, you, person. Yeah, because there's a bit more of a coherency yeah. there and an yeah, identity. Yeah, because it's really what happened. A competition is what happened on that on day. On day, yeah. And it's not necessarily about, like, potential. You know, where that might be, like, if I'm auditioning someone for my university, I'm looking yeah. more for potential because okay. you're, you know, it's uh, over a long period of time. Yeah. The competition is more about really what One happened. Day, yeah. yeah. And I absolutely believe that there needs to be a first prize winner every single oh, time. Oh, thank goodness for that. <laughs> Do they have split prizes at NFA as well? Not, Can they have? It's not typical, but I have seen it before okay. where they have maybe not given a first prize and given two seconds. And, like, if I'm on that jury, I'm going to make harsh. a big fuss about it. Let me yeah. tell you that. <laughs> That's harsh. I feel like... Yeah, no first prize at all. I I don't know. You can give one. I'm sure you can find something to agree on to edge one person ahead of the other just for the sake of the integrity of the competition. Yeah, that to me is a jury problem. Like, the yeah. jury is negating their responsibility, and they are not able to choose. You know, it doesn't matter if you think that they're not up to the level that they should be. Yeah. That's a, that's a different story, and that could happen, and that might be the case. But of the people who are there that day, it is your job as a jury to determine who you feel is the one that played the best per the requirements. That's yeah. it. That's I don't think it's very complicated. <laughs> yeah. But then obviously music is so subjective and yeah. if you have five people on the jury, does yeah. it sort of work like majority rules then? Yeah, I, I kind of can be like that. You know, and I think some people, maybe it's an ego thing. I don't know. They think, well, they didn't play at the level that I played when I did. And it, yeah. it doesn't really matter. It doesn't has nothing to do with that it's not about us yeah I and mean, when we are we're only there because of course we have a certain amount of expertise to be able to you know determine if it was a quality performance or not but but in the end you know they these people have given months years yeah. of years of their life obviously practicing but just for this specific event yeah and preparing two three four rounds i think it's disrespectful to them to not Give yeah. a first prize. I totally agree, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. And do you look for anything, like, specific for high school level? Because obviously that's a totally different ball game. Yeah, They're it so is. Young. But you know what? Honestly, like, the level is so high these days. They all really? come yeah. in performing everything from memory. And, you know, I think the last time I judged it was... The last time I judged the high school now was over 10 years ago. And the commission okay. piece that year was actually on Greg Patillo's beatbox Oh, yeah. Piece. Which is not a piece of standard rap. Yeah. Now. And, you know, average high school kid is not going to be knowing how to, like, beatbox no. that well. No. I mean, they might know some basics. <laughs> yeah. But being a master beatboxer, and, That's, like, yeah. you kind of have to be. And, like, I was so impressed, like, because you only get a very, you know, you get a couple of months. And it's one thing to learn a piece over a couple of months. That's okay. That's yeah. fine. But like to have to learn a really a new, skill, a new yeah. skill like that and be able to do it very effectively. And, it, yeah. you know, and everyone, everyone did uh, amazingly well. So, you know, I'm very, usually very, very impressed with the, the high school level. Um, you know, maybe, you know, interpretation, let's say Baroque music, for example, yeah. if they had to play a Baroque piece, their interpretation at that point might you know i'm not going to maybe worry as much about that is because most of the time they're just doing what the teacher is telling them a, to a, do at high school level that's high school obviously level. yeah so you can't really you know put a whole lot of stock into yeah. that because it's mostly going to be coming from the teacher at that point of course yeah. when they're getting a little bit more developed they'll probably have a little bit more larger broader sense of culture and learning about these things and they probably will be making some of their own decisions and then you can maybe definitely take yeah. that into account you know um but maybe that's where i might be a little bit more let's say yeah. give a little bit more wiggle room yeah i think that. that's fair yeah, yeah i am shocked to be fair when i see the level of some of these high school kids playing i'm like oh yeah it's 16 years of age and not just the level of the playing the confidence on stage yeah i think yeah. back when i was 16 i could have maybe faked confidence but i didn't actually have confidence these kids you see them coming in even the way they hold themselves in the building you're like oh you're like little artists already at 16 years of age? Yeah, it's, it's um, you know, it's it's fascinating to see as a, you know, as a teacher, obviously I'm constantly interacting with young people and seeing, you know, how things are changing over time too. And I think in some ways they have a lot of confidence in some things and other ways like not as much, you know. Okay. Because I think of like these days everything 
kind of revolves around like self. For example, your phone, like you have your whole world on your phone. Yeah. You can do like self checkout at the store. We don't have to speak to anybody, True. right? So there's all these things where their life kind of exists in the context of their own yeah. world. And I think the way you gain basic confidence as a human being is how you interact with other people. Other people yeah. And I think that with some things, interesting. they are really confident with, but with others, they're not because like they're, the way their life has been set up for them um, through various things um, creates a kind of a sense of insecurity or if they haven't experienced something already, then they kind of almost freak out. Like, oh, God, what do I do? You know, like, yeah. kind of a, a lesser ability to, like, maybe react quickly. To I some totally... So, yeah, because you've thing. been teaching at the University of Iowa for a while. How long have you been teaching there? Well, I'm going to be starting my 18th wow. year Congratulations. This year. Thank you. Yeah. So what changed, like, because obviously you're getting these kids. They are kids of that age still. They're very young when yep. they come in. Have you seen different challenges over the 18 years? Oh, absolutely. Socially, absolutely. I mean, not just in terms yeah. of food plan. Absolutely. I think it's what I just kind of mentioned. Yeah. I think that certainly the pandemic didn't help, you know, going True. through all that. I kind of forget about that sometimes. I know. Yeah. I know. Um, but that's, like, the biggest thing, I think, is, um, you know, there's a lot of talk these days about, um, you know, emotional issues or we talk about anxiety, depression, yeah. which are very serious yeah. topic yeah. and they should be treated, taken seriously. But I think through social media, there's so much about that kind of thing that young people think maybe they have like a bigger issue with something and they don't that realize that is. they're just having like basic human emotions. Yeah, <laughs> you that's know? true. Yeah. It's like go up and go down. So, like, navigating that, I feel like, has been a l little bit more challenging. Because, um, you, again, you want to treat these issues very seriously yeah. if students are experiencing hard times. But also kind of give them a perspective, like... Well, that's your role as an educator, yeah. yeah. So, it's, it's a tricky balance. That's, I think, I what's the, imagine, like, yeah. the, the hard part about it is finding a balance to be like okay it's you're yeah. overdoing it a little bit with yeah. that right now and then you know trying to guide them in the best way if they are experiencing a hard time yeah somehow. because that'll relate directly to performing as well because obviously performance anxiety is something we all go yeah. through at some point um but if that's masked with generalized anxiety as well that can be a really difficult thing to navigate too and then the corona era I, again i totally forgot the corona happened i sometimes yeah, i blanked that out of my mind but you've got a generation of musicians who have maybe got to the, the really important part of their education of early university, and they're not performing for people. Yep. And then after two or three years, suddenly they're out there, and they haven't developed these skills, which are so important, I mm -hmm. think. Did you find it difficult to teach during Corona? And yeah, I mean, look, this is what I th thought about COVID. And I know a lot of people had a, bi a bad time during COVID, especially for musicians, so I don't want to romanticize it. Yeah. I had a great time. Oh, me too, yeah. Because <laughs> I... For me, I'm not a rules person. I don't really care what someone, you vibe, know, yeah. you know, people like say that. you're supposed to do. I'm going to think I'm going to do what I think is yeah. best to do. And what I saw during COVID was an opportunity to do something different, do things in a different way. Okay. So at the university, I was very lucky. We have amazing facilities. We had a flood years ago and knocked out our building. And then we got yeah. like beautiful new building. <clears throat> So we had the opportunity to teach in person in our large concert halls. Okay. This is like a dream come true to actually be able to teach students how to play in the spaces that they're going to perform in instead of a tiny little room, which we don't perform in, right? Of course, yeah. So we, yeah, we got to use our major concert hall in the School of Music, and then we have an additional performing arts center that's a 2,500-seat auditorium, and I got to teach master classes in there. On the regular then, yeah. On the, on the big stage. So, you know, I thought it was I thought it was great. And then we did our Zoom lessons and what everybody did. But it was kind of like we were able to do a sort of hybrid. And so, you know, I tried to utilize the resources we had at that time. I'm big they in are, yeah. utilizing the resources yeah. that you have. So, um, you know, I saw... Big Bear Grylls, I love that. Yeah, yeah. I... You know, um, I had my students do various projects that I normally might not have them do, but I was like, why, why should I have had them make like uh, video tutorials for like um, high school kids auditioning for our like all state festival yeah. that we have in the U.S. I had them record with pre-recorded tracks because that's a skill in itself, you know. Entirely, so yeah. I just try to, you know, flow with the go, as I say. Yeah. And 
flow with the girls. <laughs> yeah. I've never heard that before. Yeah. That is great. <laughs> And is that you? Did you make that up? I don't know. I, I don't know if so. I heard it or whatever, but that I just... That is great. I like I've never flip, heard that before. You know, people... <laughs> <laughs> I've been to that, yeah. Let, you know, people say, let's get the show on the road. I say, yeah. let's get the showboat on the river. I don't know. Just oh, kinda... How many more of these do you have? <laughs> I don't know. I come up with weird stuff sometimes. So. Yes. Have a think about the police for me because I would love to get a, okay. <laughs> a, like a highlight reel going on them. They're right. great. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, well, let's move on a little bit because I could talk about this all day, but I do have to get on to your other role here at NFA, yep. which is performing. Yep. So you're playing on Friday, we were Friday, just saying. Friday, yep. yeah. Yeah, so start. you've got a chamber music recital, flute and harp. Flute and harp, yes. Yeah. I've, I've obviously got the book. I've seen the program. Yeah. Now, for anyone, I think if you're reading the program and you haven't listened to your second album, you won't be familiar with a lot of these composers. Yeah. But if you, I'll get to the second album later, because obviously I've listened to it, <laughs> obviously. I do a lot of research. But can you tell people about the program, the reason behind it, what's going on with it? Sure. So um, the what we're playing here and performing with Çatay Akyol, who's a wonderful Turkish harpist. And He's over here. Um, <laughs> sitting over there, yeah. <laughs> uh, so the music that we're playing here is a little kind of snapshot of our second album which is called intersections yes um chatai being from turkey obviously yeah. turkey is like you know cradle of civilization um yeah, it's yeah. a very very rich uh area culturally and musically and so um turkey is literally an intersection between europe and asia yep yeah. Uh, as a land bridge. Is that why the album's called Intersections? That's why it's called Intersections. There we are. So um, the music is from basically Turkey and surrounding areas. So uh, Turkey, Bulgaria, Armenia, Azerbaijan. Yep. And the album also uh, Turkmen Republic at the time, former Soviet yep. Republic. So kind of this intersecting area. That is so uh, fascinating. Yeah. Did you know much about that music before you explored the album actually yes somewhat um the Amarov six pieces i've played for years yeah um, they pop up the odd yeah, time i've seen them pop that, up that's a wonderful piece um and um some pieces were new uh like this um shapashnikov adrian shapashnikov sonata for that's the only al the, actually on the album the only original piece uh for flute and harp is the shapashnikov ah, okay. uh, sonata Besides, actually, I should say, um, a piece was written for us, which will we play here um, yeah. by Kamal Ganuch, which is a really lovely piece. Um, but the Shapashnikov Sonata is, is pretty popular. There's several recordings of it. Um, but it's like the only piece that the guy ever wrote, really. So okay. it's very fascinating. And yeah. it's a beautiful piece. So, it is good yeah. music, yeah. yeah. What's the reason for bringing it to the NFA? Um, I think that people don't play a lot of music from that region generally. You know, I, I we, totally agree, We yeah. play mostly... Uh, European composers or in the US yeah. obviously we play a lot of American yeah. composers um, I love folk music so most of the music is actually based on it's not all of it isn't like folk music specifically but it's all based on folk music um, the Bulgarian uh, pieces that we play are actually 10 pieces we're just playing one they have all sorts of mixed meters you know all the yeah, Balkan rhythms yeah it's crazy that's yeah. I love all yeah. that so love that and just yeah something a little different that you know um, the last thing, sorry, that we need to hear is another, you know, Carmen Tennessee or Reinica Sonata. I mean, we, we know how those go. <laughs> Ooh, the controversy. <laughs> the controversy. We know how those go. I mean, you won't typically generally find me playing that kind of stuff on recitals. No? No. Okay. Um, I just think, you know, we, we have so much repertoire. And we that's, do. It's not yeah. that that's not good repertoire. It's completely fine. I just feel like why like why do we continue to play that yeah piece? it's because somebody said that was the one we should play and that everyone keeps doing the it reason. yeah i think there's yeah. a misconception sometimes that uh we play these pieces a lot because they're better and that's not true when you no. look into the socioeconomic reasons of why it could be something as simple as oh well this piece was written by a woman yeah so they didn't play it in the 1800s yeah. because women were second class citizens yeah. and now we can do it yeah so i think it's great to be able to do that but i will say at the same time i've been looking through the nfa program there's not many classics in this year. There, there isn't. I no mean, I think hits. the NFA has gone away from that a little bit. And I do think there needs to be a mix because there, we, we, we want to have that. I mean, that's most of the time the reason why we chose to play the internet. Yeah. We heard that stuff. I think there's a place for that. It's a healthy mix, isn't it? We yeah. want to have that. It's important for young people, for students to be able to hear that. I just think, um, you know, for me personally, like, of course I play standards and I can play them all. And I, if you ask me to record, like, Every standard piece tomorrow, I could, I, could, yeah. I could do it, yeah. obviously. But I just, you know, we have enough people that are doing that, and I feel like I have the ability to be curious, which I think yeah, is important. Yeah, which is and, cool. and I like to 
uh, share other things with people. And sometimes yeah. it works. Like, well, sometimes it works, but sometimes just seeing one performance, it can make that piece part of the standard rep. I've seen that happen over yeah. the years. I've seen pieces suddenly that maybe 10 years ago we weren't playing and they suddenly crept up and you're seeing them all over recital programs and things like that. Even a lot of the concertos as well, a lot of the bigger concertos that were written for violin, they're becoming nearly standard flute rep because a couple of players have done them. We're like, oh, yeah, yeah let's give that a go. Yeah. It's really cool. I... I I want the mixture. Like, this is my first NFA, so I love seeing all the new music and discovering new things, but it's a bit like going to, like, a rock concert. You know, oh. you want to hear the classics, too. Totally get it. I want to I hear totally the big hits. You know. I totally get it. I agree. I agree. We want to hear that I would that love a wee Carmen Fantasy or something <laughs> this week, or, like, a, yeah, a Reinecke Sonata or something, or a César Fonk Sonata. I would love one of them. Just to... No, absolutely. And don't get me wrong. It's wonderful music, and we should play that. And, like, of course, I'm teaching my students this repertoire, um, but <clears throat> what I find, like, with students, for example, is... If they're only playing that, I feel like they're only just comparing themselves to the like kind of iconic performances that they've heard of these pieces. This is a big issue. And yeah. it's hard for them to kind of discover who they are through the music, you yeah. know, because there's such a preconceived idea Entirely. of how it should go. And there is a way that it goes, basically. But, you know, when a student has to design, let's say, a program, um, a themed program about wind and water or something like yeah. that and you play other pieces, it, they have to really think a lot about how to present that yeah. product artistically. And it's a little different than just playing something we know how it goes, yeah. you know? Also for students these days, we were saying earlier, but it is difficult if you're playing like a, a Reinecke Sonata and you think, well, students these days, they go to Spotify and they type in Reinecke Sonata and they get 200 results. Yeah. And I wouldn't, if I was 16 when Spotify was that big, I would have been so overwhelmed by that. Like, I had, like, two or three CDs, and that was it, and I stuck to them. <laughs> it's kind of why I end up playing, like, James Galway all the time. Well, not like James I wish I played like James Galway, but <laughs> yeah. with an inspiration. <laughs> but for students these days, I can find that difficult. I think it's good to be able to do something totally fresh, and you can put your stamp on it straight from the beginning, especially at that younger age, where you're sort of learning your artistry and learning yeah. your craft a little bit. I'm, I, I'm glad to see that at the NFA as well. A lot of the competitions have newly commissioned works. Yep. I think it's a really cool skill. Yeah, I mean, it's... It's um, it's the language of music, right? It's yeah. a, it's a language. So, um, that's something I always tell my students. Like, if someone asks you if you speak more than one language, even if you don't speak another spoken language, you should always say yes, because music is a language in itself. True. We, so, you know, what makes it complicated is we have so many like basically like dialects inside of this like, yes. language, yeah. you know. And so you have to have a lot of savvy in terms of interpretation to, to speak the language very, very well, of course. 100%, um, yeah. But, but, you know, it's uh, to, uh, to look at how someone will take a newly commissioned work and how they're able to use their language skills basically for it's real this artistry interpretation that, yeah. is important now. Yeah. yeah, it's a really good skill. Yeah. Um, well, I'm looking forward to the concert. I'll definitely be there on Friday. Thank you. Thank I have you. to make sure I circle the book. <laughs> I'm going to do that today. I'm going to go through the book and circle my favorite ones. I know, ones and there's make sure so I find them. many things there's to too much. So it's, many it's things. sensory overload for yeah. me. There's too much flute. <laughs> I'm not actually, yeah, I say this all the time in the podcast. For someone who runs a flute podcast, I'm not the world's biggest flute fan. I like to get a little bit of break from flute, and I feel like the next four days are going to be a lot of flute. So going to be a lot of flute. No, yeah. I get it. I get it. I mean, a little bit of a break from flute sometimes. I think we all live in our own little flute bubbles, too, you know. And then when you come to the NFA, even just like kind of the moment you step into the hotel and you hear like three people Straight playing away. flute in the hallway you get this kind of you weird go, oh, like oh no. my god what is all like, this <laughs> i know that's the first thing is we heard someone practicing i actually came from where was i before i came to san antonio del rio mm. not that far like two hours yeah. away there was two people practicing flute in that hotel oh, wow. like oh those guys are definitely going to the nfa <laughs> if not i should probably knock the door and say by the way there's a convention two hours away but straight away i'm like wow this is going to be a lot of flute. I'm ready for it. Yeah. I think I'm ready for it. Yeah, you got to you got to you got to be ready. You got yeah, I didn't even bring my flute with me. I <laughs> oh, thought really? I'm not Yeah, cuz I've been traveling for 2 weeks as well. Yeah, I get and it. And I didn't want to bring it to the states either. I don't know. I just thought maybe something will happen to it. I, maybe I would lose it. So, <laughs> I didn't bring my flute. And I thought there's going to be enough flutes here. If I need to play the flute, someone will give me a flute. That's true. There's no shortage of flutes here. I've so done that be fine. Before. Okay, yeah. so that'll be on Friday. <laughs> well, that's a lovely segue then into the two albums yeah. cuz I do want to talk about sure. these. Um, let's talk about the first one. Yep. Now, Dancing in Dreams, 2021? 2021, yeah. Yeah. Now, that's all, there's no no original, but nothing in there is written originally for Flute and Harp, is it? No. That's all arrangements? No. It's all arrangements. Um, you Mostly know, by yourself and Chateau? Yeah, we did some of them, and some of them were already done just fine, so we used them. Um, you know, Chata and I had never met in person before we recorded this album. Seriously? Seriously. 
We never played. Oh, you we, guys did videos together. Yes, like we the, never played together. But so you did our, the like our, the, the Destiny you know, recording was, videos. Yes, our duo was born out that. of the pandemic. Um, so basically, um, <laughs> we we decided to record something, you know, remotely. Um, the yes. pandemic was just Piazzolla's Oblivion. Yeah, gorgeous and, piece. Yeah. I love Oblivion. And um, people kind of went crazy for it, and we're like, Yes, I remember. And, and how it went, literally, Chata, um I said, Here, let's do this Oblivion. He said, Okay, so. He recorded it, sent it, sent me his part. I played over it, and five minutes I later, that. I sent it back to him, and I said, "Here, I'm finished." He's like, "That was it." I said, "Yeah, just one time. It was like perfect, you know." So um, people loved it and said, "Oh, you should record an album together." And we said, "Like, you know, why not?" Why not? And that was it. That's that how was I was it. born. So the first time we met in person when we played together was when we recorded. So and where did you record it? Where we was recorded that? it and um, at the University of Iowa, where I teach in our beautiful concert hall. It's a stunning concert hall. Um, actually in the hall we have, since you live in Germany, we have an organ that is the same organ builder as the Elbe Philharmonie. Oh, in wow. Okay. So yeah. it's pretty cool. Yeah. The Elbe Philharmonie, I'm sure, well, all my European listeners will definitely know about the Elbe Philharmonie yeah. for the Americans. It is, I think, the coolest concert hall in the world. It's state of the arts up in Hamburg. It is incredible. Right on the water side. It is. Yeah. Yeah. So if you got one like that, you're doing all right. Yeah. So the yeah. hall is, is gorgeous. So we recorded there. And so... We decided to keep the music a little on the um, that lighter side. I don't. Piazzolla history of the tango for the harp is nothing light. I'd say that's like, not very light. Not <laughs> light at all. But in terms of for the listener, yeah, okay. Um, you know, and it was kind of born from the fact that our first thing that we did together was the Oblivion. So that is on the album. So we decided to do. So you build up from there. Then you yeah. say we got that. Yeah. We're gonna. And we want to do the history of the tango and, yeah. you know, natural Piazzolla obviously is a lot of French influence there as I studied with Nadia Boulanger. Yeah. So we decided to pair it with some kind of traditional French favorites, yeah. you can say. Um, and I think it turned out really nicely. It so. did turn out really yeah. nicely. <laughs> and what about like recording it and stuff? And the, did you release it yourself? Did you go to your record label? Yeah, we have a record label. It's MSR Classics and the U.S. Um, a lot of, it's a pretty big company in the U.S., a yeah. lot of flute players. Um, I had a, some other albums on there, so yeah. I decided to yeah, and that was go it. over that. Yeah. How long did it take from like the recording process to having the album out? Pretty, it seemed to happen very quick. Pretty fast. We recorded in summer, I think it was, yeah, uh, July or August. We got all the editing done within like a week or two. Yeah. We just hit it like super fast. And... Um, it got it came out in October and streaming. So nice. Okay, like that is months. quick. Yeah. Yeah. And then when the when that album comes out, are you already thinking, right? Let's get on the album number two. Yeah, we did it pretty quickly. It was like a year later that yeah. we recorded the next one. Yeah, I mean, I I love to play. Like you know, I just love to play lots of stuff. So I'm yeah. always kind of ready to go. Harp is not. Harp is a little bit more complicated than flute, so, yeah, you know. Yeah, it's a little bit more work, to say the um, least. And Chate is amazing, and, and it, wonderful. Everything was absolutely wonderful. But, you know, for a harpist to, like, get repertoire, like, going like that, especially. Yeah. And I'm terrible because I'm making him play piano parts most of the time. Exactly, which is very <laughs> difficult. Very like, difficult. Can be very difficult, yeah. So, you know, uh, we, we, we have not planned our third yet but we are starting to think about it okay yeah. that was gonna be my next question it was something for like a little exclusive yeah. there can you tell me anything about what you're thinking you know there's so many possibilities i'm you know i know female composers is very popular right yeah, now but true. you know i've been playing female composers for a very long time I know. even before yeah. it was maybe you know as popular um i think there are a lot of great uh pieces for flute and harp by female composers that maybe people are a little less familiar with than some yeah. of the other standards. So we might go that route. You know, I kind of let the see what comes. musical winds blow where they go, you, you know? Post, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, that's kind of how I've done most things in my life. I, I am a planner. I like to plan ahead and do things, yeah. but I also like to be kind of free and flexible to not be kind of locked down yeah. into stuff. Yeah. To see um, one. Yeah. So, you know, you have kind of periods where, like, the creative juices are really, really flowing. Yeah, and then you yeah. have periods where you're just kind of, like, laying low in that. And I think it's important to 
pay attention to that and not force force things. Yeah, I think it's as important a part of the yeah. creative process as yeah. the the juice is flowing. Yeah, I hate saying that. I don't know. There's something I know, about saying that. Gross. Yeah, sorry about uh, that. No, don't worry. It's, it's my fault. <laughs> um, on female composers, because I was doing, I was reading about your bio, reading your biography yeah. and stuff, and while we're talking about female composers, I don't know if this is a coincidence. Now I've got the list here, but you studied with a lot of female flute teachers. Yeah, I did. Is that a coincidence or is that um, semi deliberate? Was there a thinking behind that? Because most, of, well, a yeah. huge amount of your teachers were female. I think it's, I mean, in the U.S., maybe flute is a little bit more female dominant than in Europe. I think a lot mm. of, you know, it's kind yeah. of mi more. I think they're, it just so happened that the people that I studied with okay. were female. Yeah. I definitely auditioned at schools that had male teachers. Yeah. It just, for whatever reason, turned out that I had mostly female teachers and I did have some male teachers too. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, most of them just happened to be female. I, I, I don't think at the time I was thinking I want to study with okay. a female or anything like that. Yeah. 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 I think you're... I've actually, I had a friend who wrote a dissertation about this, wrote a thesis on this, because the amount of female people who study at music college is very high in Europe, but the amount of people in positions yeah, in orchestras I, is very that's low. What I, yeah. And that's kind of the issue. Yeah. I think America was much more ahead in that. Yeah. The USA getting females into principal flute jobs and stuff. Actually, the one I really want to ask about that, I did an episode a long time ago on female principal flutes. Uh -huh. And I went, I made a list of every country in the world and where they got their first, when they got their first female principal flute. The number one was actually Australian. Which was quite surprised by they got their first female principal flute in like 1930 something. Mm -hmm. But after that was Dorio Anthony Dwyer, yeah. who you studied with. Yeah, I, I had like, I did all of her um, workshops when I was I in high school. I need to hear school. more about this. Yeah. I mean, Mrs. Dwyer was like a force of nature. Do I you mean, refer to her as Mrs. Dwyer? We at the did. Time? Yeah. I mean, yeah, we just. Okay, so my very first interaction um, with Mrs. Dwyer was. This was at Tanglewood. We had cl flute class in yep. these barns, these old barns. Okay. I'm actually from Western Massachusetts where Tanglewood is. So oh, okay. Like so that's handy, in my yeah. neighborhood. And so we're all excited, you know, waiting for her to show up, you know, and we're there for a while. Well, it just so happened that they had renovated the um, bathrooms near the big music shed where the yeah. concerts are. And they put all the old toilets okay. in the barn where we were having class. Why not? What a great idea. So, you know, we, we're like, whatever. We're just waiting for, you know, her to come. They're cool. There are toilets there. And she walks in. And first of all, she had these shoes on that were way too big for her. And she had tissues shoved in the back of them. And she walks in Iconic. and she gets, like, flustered. And is like, what is the meaning of this? What is the meaning of this? <laughs> Pardon me because of all the toilets so she's like freaking out over the toilets and gets so flustered but when you say all the toilets you mean like they're <laughs> there were like a hundred toilets like a hundred there were like a shit ton of toilets excuse what? me <laughs> but there was like so many excuse toilets the pun, yeah. <laughs> um no pun okay, intended a hundred yeah. toilets is a lot i thought there you were, were like lot. four no there were like i don't know if there were a hundred but there was like a very large amount of toilets in the barn i feel like anything over 10 is a large it's, amount. it was a large amount you know because it's the, they were they renovated the main bathrooms for the shed which seats thousands of people so anyway, she freaks. She's like freaking out about the toilets, and she falls flat on her face. No. And you know she's in her probably in her seventies at that point, and so we're all like, "Mrs. Dwyer, Mrs. Dwyer," and and she's like, "I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine," and she stands up. So the next day, we come to class in the barn, no toilets, toilets are gone, and there's a little table with milk and cookies. No Literally way. Literally milk and cookies sitting there, and then she shows up again, and she's like, "Oh." Wonderful. I see they brought you the milk and cookies I requested as an apology for the what? toilet. So that was kind of like, And you that know, was all her? Just she went there that and was said, all right, her. She made it, she made it happen. Milk and cookies. And I got rid what? of the toilets. Okay. Yeah. So that she, does say a lot about her character then, doesn't it? Yes. And then, um, you know, classes were wonderful with her. So much about musicality and phrasing. But she was tough. I mean, there was, I remember there was a girl from Germany, actually. Yeah. Her name was Imke. Okay. And she was playing the Bach B minor sonata mm -hmm. first, you know, first movement, which is quite obviously challenging. But Big piece, yeah. I think she spent 30 minutes just on the first two <laughs> notes trying to get this girl to say with or play it with the right inflection. And she was using her name and she was going, Imka. And the girl would go, Imka. No, 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 no. Imka. And they did that for like 30 minutes, you Not know. Insane. So it was wild. Um, her kitchen got on fire. That was at her house. Yeah, I was in during charge. During a lesson? Yeah, it was during a master class. Actually, we had a guest 
um, Donald Peck, he was a yes. former principal yeah. of Chicago Symphony, yeah. was there teaching. And he was teaching the class. She was making the dinner in the kitchen. And she said, Nicole, you're in charge of helping me uh, if I need it. Okay, cool. I, I'm 16 years old. Anyway, yeah. so all of a sudden, you know, I'm paying attention to the class. But, you know, I'm, from time to time, I kind of look to the kitchen yeah. to see if things are all right. And I look over the kitchen and I see like flames bursting. Like proper. You know? Yeah, like flames <laughs> coming up. And I'm like, well. Which is not ideal, listen. <laughs> not the best. <laughs> Probably thing. not. So I'm like, maybe this would be a good time to go and help her. So I go in the kitchen and I'm like, Mrs. Fire, uh, can I help you? And she's like, no, no, I'm fine. And then she puts out the fire. She literally hands me a bowl and she's like, put these in the freezer. We're having frozen grapes for dessert. So, she just puts the fire out. Yeah, How did she put the fire out? I don't even remember because I was just like, it was all such like a strange moment. And I just remember all of a sudden I was, I was holding a bowl of frozen grapes or going to freeze the grapes or something about the frozen grapes. That, that was more significant than... Apparently. I, wow. Uh, my 16-year-old mind, I See, guess. See, I wanted to read... Because <laughs> I've looked, tried to find more information about her because the little tidbits of information you get about her, like stories or anecdotes, they sound incredible. Yeah. And I've been trying to dig up more on it. I feel like there's not enough written about her or... No, I think probably... There should be a there, lot more. There should be a lot more. I mean, I think she was a remarkable lady and you have to be... I mean, at that point in time, you had to be so tough to... I mean, to, I can't even... Like, know? I've had... My, uh, my teacher in Paris was the first principal flute in a French orchestra, but this is in, like, the 70s. Yeah. She got her job. Like, this... Dory Anthony Dwyer was 1952. Yeah. Like, that, I imagine for most of her career, she was only playing with men. Mm -hmm. And I cannot imagine the challenges she would have went through for that as well. You have to be made of really tough stuff. Oh, absolutely. Well, even though I didn't, you know, study with her a lot, it was mostly through master classes, but it was yeah. very intense. So, you know, those studies impacted me greatly yeah. as a player. Um, my One of my first, like, you know, real teachers in high school was Marianne Gedigian, who will be performing yeah. here a bunch. And she's is she studied, playing this week? She is, she is. Oh, yeah, nice, yeah. okay. And, you know, she's absolutely amazing and wonderful. And she studied with Mrs. Dwyer, so I definitely got a lot oh, cool. of, you know, of that yeah. influence Oh, that's well. so cool. Yeah. Yeah, I was reading the list of the teachers actually as well, because she studied with, okay, now pronunciation, we've talked about this before the podcast. Uh -huh. I am not good with name pronunciation. It's all okay? good. I'm going to blame being Irish on him. But is it Jean Backstress or Jeannie Backstresser? When you look at it, it's written as Jean, but she refers herself uh, as Jeannie. Thank goodness. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, because I have the same with Jeannie Galway as well. Yeah. I'm never sure which way to do it. Okay. Yeah. But you studied with Jeannie Backstress then as yeah. well? Yeah. She was my teacher for four years in my uh, bachelor's degree. Amazing. I mean, you know, Miss um, Backstress, as I always refer to her, she'll refer say, to as Miss Backstress. Yeah, Backstresser. because she's, and, you know, again, in my, like, you know, basically teenage mind yeah. she's Miss Backstresser but that's nice I find uh, that a real nice like a mark yeah. of respect I mean she will insist of course if we call her a genie sometimes we called her JB oh that's uh, cool it's funny yeah. there's a lot of JB flute players actually out there Is it? yeah um, but um, so you know she was like Kind of like the Oprah, Oprah, you know, who Oprah, yeah. yeah, Oprah Winfrey in the U.S. is like, you know, very famous talk show host. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I th yeah, I think even in Europe we might have got Oprah, yeah. What I mean by that is, you know, you just, Jeannie just kind of made things better when she walked in the room, you okay. know. At that point in time, she had retired already from the New York Philharmonic. Um, she had just retired. I actually was her first class at Carnegie Mellon University okay. where I studied with her. Yep, yeah. And, um, you know, she was not playing as much at that point already. But even so, she would say, honey, can you find my flute in the closet? And you'd get it for her and hand it to her. And you'd, she'd take it out. And it was like, a, you know, oh, like a choir of yeah, angels. You know, yeah. it was just like the most beautiful sign you ever heard in your life. And you're just like, really? Anyway, oh. so, no, I mean, it was it was amazing. Um, oh, she seems incredible. Yeah, she was just, um, you know, it was, it was tough. I mean, she's the sweetest person in the world. And she was never... Um, cross or yeah. never yelled at us or anything like that she's so diplomatic and so nurturing just a wonderful yeah. person and teacher but we it's had to strong. we had to we had to prepare two to three lessons every week new pieces sorry two to three new pieces every week okay you know with piano in the lessons so yeah. you know and yeah our, but then she was she was so famous so influential yeah. such a major food player i even remember she had a it was like an album. It was on Spotify as well. It was a. It was the orchestral excerpts, which yeah. she would play them and then talk about yep. them before. And even then, listening to it when I was like seventeen, I was a little bit intimidated. I'm like I can press pause at any <laughs> point, but even then, she intimidated me. There's something about her. There's there's a gravity about her. I just feel like oh, that's that's Jeannie Max Stress, you know. Yep. No, I mean I. Um, 
I I absolutely loved every moment of studying with her. Yeah. Uh, she she's she will always be so um iconic in my mind. Just yeah. I just I just loved it. I loved it. It's yeah. Awesome. Yeah. It's it's so good to see how like, the the USA is definitely far ahead of Europe in that sense with female principal flutes and stuff. There's so many great ones over here. Like Europe's getting better. There's no doubt about that, but it's still quite far behind. Yeah, that's what I meant before. I think, you know, like in terms of why I studied with women, yeah. I think it's just we naturally the in USA those positions bit, yeah. have a little bit more than yeah. maybe Europe does, even though I think, I think it's so. getting better in a way. Yeah, but, Europe's definitely getting better, yeah. but it's not it's not caught up to the USA. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's definitely not. Uh, the next topic I have to talk about this, um, we were talking beforehand, social media. Yeah. Because that's where I found you first, and I was saying, I was trying to work out exactly how long I'd followed you on social media, but I think it's 13 years. Which is a long time. Long time, I guess, yeah. And, but you were one of the very first people, I, well, one of the very first flute players I remember being active on social media, like way back when it was just Facebook, essentially, back then as yeah. well. Um, when you started doing social media back then, do you have an intention of, like, trying to get more followers or make it part of your professional portfolio, or was it just for fun? Not really. I mean, people ask me to do talks on social media and all this stuff all the time, and usually the first thing I say is I have, like, three words that I'm allergic to. One oh, is God. like brands. Oh, thank you. Two is content. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm going to change these questions. <laughs> no, it's because content to me, it's just not content. It's not something I'm doing to like for social media. It's yeah. my life. And I'm, I feel free to share what yeah. I'm doing in my everyday life which a lot of the time includes a lot of flute and sometimes it doesn't have any flute at all. So, yeah. um, and I fight against, I think these days there's such a push to have a brand and I get it. I understand it's something recognizable, but I kind of fight against that because I don't want to be defined by other people. Yeah. One. Okay. Okay. I don't want to be put in a box. It's an interesting spin on it. Yeah. So maybe my brand is that, that I'm, you can't, you know, have a no pin brand. me down. <laughs> yeah. One thing. You know, you asked me a little earlier before we were talking about Piccolo. I do a lot of Piccolo, but honestly, this is very honest. One of the reasons why I stopped doing as much Piccolo is because I didn't want to be branded as a Piccolo player. Yeah. Not because yeah. there's anything wrong with that. It's just that personally, I, again, I don't want to be defined by other people. Yeah. Because then people tend to kind of only see you in those roles. And that's part of what I do. Yeah. And so that's why I like to keep people guessing. And like, you might like see that. me doing this one minute and you might see me doing another thing another minute. Um, and that's kind of maybe part of my brand, but I never saw yeah. social media. I mean, obviously I'm not dumb. Like I know that when you use social media, it's an easy way to reach a lot of people. Yeah. And that's what we are trying to do. And effectively as musicians is we're trying to communicate with people. So yeah, I know that social media is a, is a it's wise a turn, way yeah. to, to communicate with people, especially with students interacting with them as a teacher, those kinds of things. This is interesting, yeah. Um, but I never was thinking like, oh, I'm going to do this for, this will be really cool if I do this okay, for that's, Instagram. Yeah. Nope, that's just, uh, that's my life. And sometimes I'm wacky, I do weird I stuff. That, yeah. and I just, that maybe is the secret thing. A lot yeah. of it is, most of what you see is um, pretty spontaneous. Just, yeah. Okay. So you don't plan your, your post site or anything? Nope. Or say, no. No. Nope. Love that. You're not going to find was... me with color-coded stuff and okay. any of that. Nope. Yeah. That's I not my jam. And if, that. if that's your jam, <laughs> no, go I don't for do it. it. No, no I'm but I'm saying, bad. if someone, you know, if, if that's what you want to do, like, everyone's got to be sincere well, to themselves. Yeah. And it's becoming an art form in itself, social yeah. media as well. So if you choose to express yourself that way, that's cool as well. Um, that's I have what to ask, I think what was about. the third thing? Oh. I, I, the third word, brand, I, I content. Content, and there was probably, I, I know, I, there was another word. You've I left me on the hook here. I know, I'll, I have to think of it <laughs> okay, now. Okay, you can leave the but listeners on the hook as well. That's like what I'll say about it is, like, you got to do what's sincere to you. Yeah. And I think that's, like, you might see someone doing something that's very successful. But it's sin if it's sincere to them, that's great. But it might not be sincere to you. And if you try to copy that, then... It might not be successful no, because it's, it's going to be just, sad as well. Yeah. You're not going to enjoy the process. So that's what I just feel a little bad about with social media is I see certain trends and then people think, wow, that was really successful. So I'm going to do, do that, that too. Yeah. And in general, I think those kind of things, even like I call it hero worship, you know, when we have like a favorite of something, like a yeah. favorite flute, isn't it? Yeah. I find that that's one of the biggest limiters of like, creativity and curiosity you yeah, know interesting so i think people should do what's most sincere to them yeah 
and that could be that can mean many different things. You don't have to be defined in one specific way. I totally agree. And yeah, again, it's it's like any other. Th- it's like being a musician. You have to do it. Yeah, be, yeah. Self expression is a really important tool to social media. But I am curious. Um, do your teachers or your teachers, your students, do they ask you about social media? Do they ask you for advice on it. Because when you're sitting with someone who's got a lot of really. followers, really. I mean, sometimes. I mean, in a my in kind of a way, but. We actually don't talk about it that okay. much. I mean, it definitely comes up, but... Because um, these days, I suppose yeah. it is a genuine part of young musicians' professional portfolio is to have it. Yeah. And I think if you have a teacher that's quite successful as it, it must be tempting to say, well, what do you think about this? Well, of course, and if they ask me, I'll tell, I tell them, we talk about it, but it's not like a major thing. And okay. I think a lot of people might think that, you know. Um, the funny thing that people maybe not don't know about me is they see me all over the place on social media, but I'm actually kind of like... Not, I'm not introverted, but I'm not social. Yeah. I'm like completely anti-social. And I, yes. And I'm, I'm really I'm not like a social butterfly. a lot butterfly. of people have told me this. Yeah, a yeah. lot of people who are like very active on social media say, yeah, no, I'm mm. quite introverted. And yeah. I like to just keep that for social media. Yeah, I mean, I'm very open as a yeah. person. Like, if I interact with you, I, like, I'm an open book. Yeah, we can see, But yeah. in terms of, like... You're a great podcast guest. <laughs> Thank you. Um, in terms of, like, you know, socials, I'm not a, like, when I'm home, I'm home. I'm, I'm teaching okay. and I'm going home. I'm not, okay. like, going out, like, doing all this stuff. So it's kind of a funny thing, um, like, the perceptions that people get from yeah. you. From, and I've actually, you know, dealt with a lot of weird stuff, like, you know, as a female with that, like, I, the way people perceive I you. I can only imagine. Yeah, and, that was one thing I was um, going to ask about. I actually about. like to, like, have fun with it because, okay. like, I think to get all <clears throat> hot and bothered by it and, you know, it's just it's giving more power to the people the, who the, are trying yeah. to define you. Yeah. So I just have fun with it, you know, like yeah. I said, you know, because as a professor, you know, you're not supposed to look a certain exactly, way. Exactly, yeah. You know, and it's just like... That's all just made up stuff of people's own like These limitations. Are constructs, yeah, they don't, yeah, yeah, they're just people's yeah. own limitations. So, but but the funny part about it is, I actually kind of live like a grandma. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah, because you look like you live a real yeah. rock and roll lifestyle. Yeah, but media. I really don't. <laughs> oh. I mean, I have fun in my life. I enjoy yeah, no, my that. life. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. But it's that's super interesting. Not, it's not. And over like the thirteen years, then have you seen different challenges come up on social media, or have you seen it change much? Because I sort of feel like 13 years ago, it was quite lighthearted. Yeah. While these days, it's very, it can be very intense. I will say that I'm, you know, for example, if you, you know, we know that, you know, if 15 years ago, when to be able to hear a live performance of a complete piece, like to have access like of that, something yeah. like pretty cool, pretty yeah. special. Nowadays, people don't want that. They True. want 15 seconds. They want, yeah, max. They yeah. want a fi- like a real minute, 30 seconds, you know? Yeah. So I think the attention span thing is a little tricky to navigate because... I feel so too, yeah. You know, everything can look great in 15 seconds. Yeah, exactly. So really presenting like real quality, like on social media can be a challenge because... You know, everyone can, yeah, find a 15 it's second. It's maddening I hope so, sometimes. That they can find 15 seconds that they sound it good on, right? So maddening. I think that's kind of a, a, a weird, yeah. what we've kind of moved into, you it know. It feels like that a bit, yeah. Like, because I, obviously I do this podcast and I do an episode every week. Some of them are guests, some of them are solo episodes, but they're about an hour long. Solo ones are maybe like 40 minutes. They're well researched, they go very in depth and stuff. And I do all that and I get X amount of streams and then I see somebody does like a 20 second clip of them playing the Godfather theme with 2 million views and I'm going, man, for fuck's sake, like I worked so hard on that. But social media is going that way, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, that's the down part about it. I think, like, that's what I'm saying, like, just to go with it, whatever's trendy or like what's going to get a lot of views. You will not find me doing that. Yeah. I don't really give a I agree with that. I don't give a flying, you know what, if it gets views or not. I care, does it align with my ideals? Do I feel good as a person about putting this out there? Exactly. And if people look at it, great. If they don't look at it, I have the same great. attitude, yeah. There's always going to be the next so-and-so, whoever, young, popular, it, yeah. you know, it's always going to be there. But for those four or five people in the world that might give a crap, which I yeah. get what I think, they It's fun, it. though, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Do you get people coming up to you at NFA and stuff and, like, going, oh, you're the, oh, yeah, you're you're the, the Facebook one. I've seen your video. Yeah, there's a lot of that. Do you feel a bit like a celebrity sometimes? I mean, look. Like I said, we live in, in our bubble. So yeah, in our in our in flute, the flute world, yeah. in the flute world bubble, do people know who I am? Yeah, a lot of people probably it's do. Fun, yeah. But like outside of the flute bubble, no one gives a crap about us. True. Yeah, that is incredibly true. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody cares. So that's why all this kind of like hullabaloo, you know, like yeah. weird stuff that we do as flute players is like, who are we kidding? Nobody cares about us. Nobody besides cares. Us. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> it's the worst thing. So. Actually, a really funny example of that is just when I 
during Corona, I broke up with my ex-girlfriend and I was going back into the dating world. And obviously, when you go on a date with someone, mm-hmm. you say, who are you? And they ask you, what do you do for a job? When you say you're a flute player, most of the time, like, that's a job? <laughs> like, oh, I thought that sounded so much cooler in my head. Yeah, but, I know. No, your average person is not impressed yeah, by the flute at all. No. Which is quite humbling in many ways. Yeah. But at the same time, the first, because I, I haven't done a flute convention since I've had the podcast, the first time someone recognizes me for this podcast, I'm going to scream. <laughs> Oh, it's going to go straight to my well, I head. I recognize you. I recognize well, you. Well, look, there you are. The first one. I would just say last thing about social media. The only time I really um, kind of did something maybe for social media was during the pandemic. Yeah, that changed the game though, didn't yeah, it? Yeah, I, I, I recorded like 150 flute ensemble pieces. I remember all that. Which, you know, I think a lot of people were probably like, why is she doing that or whatever? But honestly, I got hundreds of messages from people who say, Please don't stop posting these. This is like the one thing that is making my day better. Yep. And it's like, if little old me can just make someone's day better. That's and for it. me, honestly, like I didn't practice a single one of those pieces. I sight read everything. Nice. I just sat down in my living room. Yeah. I mean, some were challenging. Like the biggest one day project was Bartok Romanian dances. It was 59 <laughs> videos I had to make. And I did it in one day. Everything but, yeah. was done in a day. But 59 videos 59, in one day. It was, one, it was crazy. But I did it. Yeah. And it was like, yeah, it was... Yeah, it was so many different parts, like two bass loop parts. It was crazy, whatever. That is but crazy, it's like, yeah. You know what? I actually have this capacity, and I can use my capacity to, to make someone's day a little bit better. I, yeah. I'm going to do that. It makes it all worth it. You I know. totally agree with that, yeah. That's awesome. Okay, then, we have talked for 15 minutes, so before we go, yep. I have a couple of fun questions. Like, sure. Send me quick fire. Yep. Send me quick Did I send you these in advance, or did I not? No. So Oops. they're totally... Yeah, okay, Quick authentic. Fire. That's what it is. Yeah, and should have sent them. Okay, my bad. It's okay, all good. so do you have a favorite flute concerto? Um no, and I feel I'm so lame because like I don't I don't really love like favorites because I like I want to find the value in everything. So are there things are there pieces that I think are amazing and like I gravitate towards too? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Like Lieberman concerto, that's super fun to play yeah. like, with the orchestra. But, like, the Jolivet Concerto is, like, amazing oh, as a piece, yeah. you know? So it's yeah. hard to say, like... Do you have a favorite at it. the moment, maybe? It's so... <laughs> this this question, it's so hard to get an answer out of anybody because everyone's the same. No, I really don't. I mean, that's the honest answer. I've spoken you like know? a true politician, yeah. yeah. I mean... Okay. Um, do you remember the first flute album or CD or vinyl that you bought? I... Pretty sure it was a Ron Paul Greatest Hits. Nice. Okay. Yeah. On CD? Yes. Yeah. Yes. I, or, no, it was probably cassette tape. Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Cassette tape. Yeah. A couple of people have said one of the, the Ron Paul ones, there was one where he's standing on the front. I think he's wearing like a blue suit, just holding his throat. That was great. It was a lot of back and a lot of like Baroque I think, stuff on him. Yeah. I, I, that I'm, one comes up quite a lot. There was, I think it... It might have been like a double cassette. I don't know. Yeah, I, 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 I might think... have got it in CD form later. That's why I'm getting a little confused. Yeah. But I'm probably sure. I'm pretty sure it was a Ron Paul. Okay. Yeah. That's a good one. Yeah. Ron yeah. Paul's a good one. Uh, do you remember the first album in general that you bought? So it doesn't have to be classical music. Oh, gosh. No. And you know what? I don't really like like any <laughs> kind of music. I'm such a nerd. There must be I'm something. Speaking. There must be some terrible pop music that you listened to when you were younger. I actually don't. I actually didn't. Like, no. I, I didn't. I, I'm... I'm kind of a weirdo. I mean, it's I not, no, it's really not that I album. don't like pop music. It's not about liking. It just, like, doesn't register. Like, okay. I don't even hear it. Like, gotcha. it's so weird. I honestly think it's weird. I don't I don't get why <laughs> classical music is, like, I understand it. Like, it's, like, it's your thing then, speaking, yeah. you know, English to me. But pop music just, like, never registered. And, yeah, I think I might have bought some, like, boy bands thing once but i didn't ever That's like really listen because yeah. i thought i was supposed to but i i, I uh, yeah, you know yeah. but i honestly never bought any pop album wow okay. i was the i was the one like searching Your like the local like there, yeah. walmart looking for some increment of classical music somewhere was it always flute music you were looking for or was, it was any looking classical? for orchestra music okay. yeah okay. yeah any other anything stand out as your first albums non-flute classical wise any any certain, I know, conductors or soloists or... Um, when I, mean, I was a kid, Vladimir Ashkenazi, I don't know why, I bought every album he had on piano. Well, and we I used to have to order, him. like, CDs from, like, they call BMG or Columbia House, where you filled out a little card and sent it oh, in the mail. Oh, they posted out to you? Yeah, and you ah, get, yeah, like, yeah. buy one, get ten free. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of like thing. Like, old school Netflix as well, before Netflix yeah. went online, they did that. So I bought a bunch, I remember, like, 
Brahms for Carlos Kleiber. That was one of like. That's you know, a good answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now we're talking. Something like that, you know, probably was in the mix of the first ones that I bought where I was yeah. like, whoa, this is like the shit, you know? That is, yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> okay, that's a good answer. Yeah. I like that. Brahms for. Okay. Uh, sorry, excuse me. Gotta get what? that Dr. Pepper working. <laughs> Don't, okay. The worst thing is, I've been here for three weeks and the air conditioning in America oh, it's kills horrible. my throat. Yeah. And I've been dreading the podcast because every time I laugh my throat chokes up and I'm like I can't tell my guest stop being funny please no I get it but I'm there with you but I've got Dr Pepper Um, if you could switch instruments and still be as good as you are on the flute what would you switch to if you would switch at all that's a good question you don't have to switch but I would recommend you do (laughs) I don't know maybe like French horn or something like that French horn, wow. Yeah. That's the I first actually time didn't want to play flute. I wanted to play trombone, but that was way too... I, I played it for three days. It was way, way too big to carry around. What was the appeal of the trombone? It's just too big to carry. But what was the appeal that you wanted oh, to play first? I think first? I liked a boy that played trombone, and That's I probably uh, wanted to sit are, next yeah. to him. Yeah. That, Oops. You'd be amazed how many people give the exact same <laughs> answers up. Uh, trombone, that's a weird one. I like that. Uh, if you could have any career outside of music, what would you do? Oh, FBI agent amazing answer yeah that is the best answer yet i want that answer oh i love it that's why like my students they know they can get nothing past me because i am like oh do you reckon you'd suit it yeah i i can i'm so observant so i i like they're like oh she likes so and so boy and i'm like who paul they're like oh my god how'd you know that i'm like duh i I mean like the most obvious thing in the world so yeah, I would love that. I would love to be an investigator. It's <laughs> such a good answer. Yeah. Have you ever have you ever looked in the website, the application form? You ever no, had a wee? No, too busy playing flute. I yeah, guess, but well, um, post flute then. Maybe. You ever hang up the flute? You can join the FBI. No, I think that would be super fun. That's a great answer. Yeah. Uh, okay, two questions left. Uh, first one: If you could have a drink with any musician, alive or dead, who would it be? Oh, that's a hard one. I know it's a really unfair one. And also, I should say language doesn't matter. We both assume that you speak the same language. Yeah, I think it would probably be Poulenc. Oh, great answer. So, my birthday is July 13, 713, which is like the lucky number and the unlucky number. And it's funny because I see the number everywhere, like everywhere. Like I buy a block of cheese and it's $7.13. And like I see a license plate everywhere. But the thing about Poulenc is Poulenc's life was filled with contradictions. Yeah. And that's why his music is so great because it's so simple, but he takes like melancholy and then it takes to optimism. And it's like, yes. it's like that contradiction and that like, like that double edge sword kind of 100%. thing. So I feel like we're like kind of twin souls from another yeah. life. Huh? And it's not about the flute sonata people. Flute oh, sonata the flute is fine. Is- exceptional yeah it's great but like flu sonat is like real low on my list for Poulenc of what i love he's to play he's a wonderful for guy like i've read so much he seems like so much fun first yeah. of all seems like it was a lot of fun i did an episode on him recently as well because he had a fascinating life but like he went through a lot like he, one of his best friends the composer as well whose name escapes me now uh wrote the five small pieces for flute solo french guy Anyway, it was one of his best friends. He got decapitated in a car accident in Hungary. Oh, and yeah. then Poulenc became super religious because of it. Yep. And that's where his music sort of took a big shift as well. I'm like, what, man? Poulenc's life is amazing. That's a really good answer. Yeah. Uh, okay, and the last question. Do you have a favorite drink? And it can be alcoholic or non-alcoholic. Oh, it's definitely what are you going to drink with It's Poulenc? definitely going to be alcoholic because other than alcohol, I pretty much only drink water. Okay. Coffee. Um, uh, I, What's your favorite um, alcohol? Are you cocktail? Yeah, I'm a cocktail yeah, person. Yeah, he's in my cocktail I'm guard, a yeah. cocktail person. I like a sweetie cocktail, but not too sweet. I don't like super sugary. That's gross. Um, you know, a good margarita. I, I frozen like, or and on we're the rocks. In the right, I kind of like the frozen ones, but I do like a good, if you're going classy on the rocks, you know, like, you know, but if you're just like. You don't like, have to go classy. There's you know, the inline G podcast. Like here, you don't like, be classy. Here would be a place to have a good frozen margarita. It's hot as hell. Can, and like, you know. I can actually attest. I had right? my first ever frozen margarita last night on the river walk here. It was very good. Yeah, yeah. It's so, so good to have three more. I like bourbon drinks, you know. Oh, really? You yeah. bourbon? Yeah, wow, I like bourbon cool. drinks. So I tend to do tequila, bourbon, gin. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know if Classy. I have like a favorite, but I'm I'm open. What would you drink in Poulenc? Ooh. The bartender comes on and says, Madame, Monsieur, what can I get you? I don't know. I feel like with Poulenc, it might be, have to be like some kind of cognac or something a little different a bit classy yeah, yeah. A bit, oh yeah I get that I don't know amazing well we've talked for 58 minutes this is perfect timing um, before we go do you want to tell any uh, tell the listeners to check anything out where to go obviously I'll plug for you first of all your your albums are all yeah. on Spotify especially the last two albums with the harp they are fantastic thanks so much um, and you're on social media is there anything else you'd like to tell everyone about yeah just I think you know 
playing the flute is cool. Like we've been talking, that's why yeah. we're here. Yeah. It's great. Like be open. There's so many amazing flute players and things out there to, to do and see and be open. Like have your heroes, have your favorites, but just be open because you're going to learn so much. You're going to discover so much. And, um, you know, look in the places that not everybody else looks. And that's sometimes where you find the best stuff. Beautifully paired. That's yeah. a great way to run the podcast. But thank you very much, Nicole. This was a lot of fun. Thank you for having uh, me. Yeah. Cheerio, guys. Thank you for listening. And I'll see you all Chowdy. next week. Yeah.